frequency crossover networks and full range correction networks. What are they? Why do we need them? How do they have to look like and how should they not? Hi there, this is Marius Laubeke from Hamburg, Germany and welcome to the Laubeke podcast number three. Our today's topic is the theory behind passive frequency crossover networks and full range correction networks. This podcast has become really good and uh, probably long. Active crossovers might be covered by a future podcast. The slightly shorter German ver version and all other podcasts and videos I mention here are linked in the description below. First question, what are crossover networks? They split the audible frequency range in two or more smaller ranges, which they pass on to drivers specialized for that particular range. Those ranges are called ways, and only by looking at the crossover you can tell if your speaker with three drivers like this one, which has one tweeter and two presumably identical midwoofers, is two-way, three-way, as the manufacturer claims, or maybe two-and-a-half-way. The latter has two drivers overlapping at the base, everything else doesn't make sense, and being high cut at different frequencies. By the way, this speaker on the pictures is only two-way in reality. A low pass lets low frequencies pass to the woofer. A first order low pass contains a coil in series with the woofer. A second order low pass additionally contains a capacitor in parallel to the driver connected to the point between coil and driver. In a third order low pass, a second coil is connected in series with the coil and the driver in between the capacitor and the driver. A high pass lets high frequencies pass to the tweeter. It looks similar to a low pass, but caps are exchanged with coils and vice versa. A band pass lets a limited bandwidth pass to a mid-range driver. It consists of low and high pass either connected in series or nested. I'm not 100% sure if that's the right word. All of them are called filters. The order of the filter determines the steepness of the slope. 6 decibels per octave for a first order filter, 12 decibels per octave for a second order filter, 18 decibels per octave for a third order and so forth. It further determines the phase shift at the cutoff frequency. 45 degrees at first, 90 degrees at a second, 135 degrees at a third order filter, etc. But a low pass has a negative, a high pass a positive shift. Special elements in crossovers are bandstop filters, which are as well called notch filters. They are the opposite of bandpass filters and attenuate a limited bandwidth to, for example, smooth out a symmetric peep or bump either in the frequency response or in the impedance response. They let all other frequencies pass. They consist of a coil, a cap and, in most cases, a resistor, which is called RLC circuit. I've never seen a second order band pass in a crossover because the slopes of the first order ones are already defined by their Q factor. A high Q leads to a deep notch, then sometimes without a resistor, a low Q to only a few decibels attenuation. There are two types, a series and a parallel RLC circuit. One has R, L and C in series to each other, the other one has them in parallel. A parallel RLC circuit only works as a bandstop filter if it is connected in series with the driver. A series RLC circuit only works if it is connected in parallel to the driver and a part in series with the driver is already causing attenuation at the center frequency of the, band, the bandstop. Without an attenuating part in series, it only has an effect on the impedance response and can smooth out peaks or bumps there. Nearly every crossover contains an L-pad as a voltage divider or a single resistor to attenuate a driver. An L-pad has the advantage that it linearizes the impedance of the connected driver and that the resulting impedance of L-pad and driver can be adjusted within a certain range. Together with the driver, 
that is used at its resonant frequency, mainly woofers, an L-pad or a single resistor in series should not be used. Note that passive crossovers can only attenuate, not amplify. For amplification, an active crossover is needed. Second question. What is the difference to a correction network? Full range drivers are normally not cut off by low or high pass filters. Commonly used filters in correction networks are bandstop and high or low shelf filters. Shelving filters can either be seen as a combination of, for example, a low pass with a bypassing resistor, called end resistor in parallel, or two thirds of a parallel RLC circuit. From a certain frequency on, it attenuates the rest of the spectrum by the same level. They rarely occur in crossovers too. Third question. Why do we need it? Easy answer. All drivers have resonances. Some of those are good, for example the fundamental resonance, which is the resonant frequency, but most others are bad. Having a fundamental resonance is inevitable for an oscillating system, but all other resonances are unwanted. The fundamental resonance can be read from the impedance response. I already talked about that in my last podcast. Only at tweeters which contain highly viscous ferrofluid inside their air gap, it cannot be read, read from the impedance response. At least, in most cases, those are tweeters. Anyway, in addition to the resonant frequency, other res resonances occur in nearly all drivers. In some there are more, in some less. In better drivers there should be fewer resonances within the usable range. Outside the usable range they do not necessarily need to be less strong. Within the last several years some driver designers seem to use less damping in drivers as for example coatings and instead try to shift resonances to higher frequency by adding rigidity rigidity hardwood CS for example use magnesium cones in their Excel product line which have many strong co cone break up resonances but only above 5 kHz other designers add long fibers as wood cotton banana or polymers to paper to create their design in a way that resonances don't even occur there's the strength to preserve more detail in music by lowering mechanical losses. Of course, every bit of damping adds mechanical losses because it not only suppresses resonances but also the desired signal. Even if that means that, for example, the resonance of the surround, which is usually, usually somewhere around 1 kHz, is not fully suppressed, as it can be seen in midwoofers by SB acoustics. Because you use a crossover anyway, resonances do not harm outside the desired range. Another thing you need a crossover for is shaping an adequate frequency response, because the ideal frequency response of drivers is rare. I already talked about that in my podcast about frequency responses, which you find now on the info icon. As I said, every driver has some resonances. Midwoofers have them in the highs, where the wavelength is about as big as the cone and therefore standing waves occur within the cone. The fundamental resonance is of course no standing wave but a mechanical resonance. Also in tweeters, standing wave waves do occur. In hard domes like aluminium domes, it's worse than in soft domes. That depends on how much propagating waves are attenuated inside the material, which means how the internal damping of the used material is. Maybe I should cover that in a podcast too. Attenuation is very low in metals and waves can propagate very fast in it. The speed of sound in metals is very high, about 6300 meters per second inside aluminium. The harder the material, the higher the frequency shift where resonances occur. In an aluminium dome, the breakup resonances usually are at 20 kHz or higher. In beryllium domes by Scanspeak, CS or SB acoustics, these resonances are above 30 kHz, nearly even outside the extended measurement range which goes up to 40 kHz. 
The third purpose of a crossover is to protect the mid-range driver and the tweeter against frequencies they are not capable of. Because of small diaphragm area, it is not suitable for it to play bass notes. To be capable of doing it, it would have needed the ca uh, capability of large excursions for which tweeters are not designed. So the frequency ranges the driver can or shall not be used for are kept away from it. Also, a mid-range driver needs a high pass because the sound quality improves if the bass is cut away. Therefore, it doesn't have to produce large strokes for which it is mainly not designed because it is usually smaller than the woofer. The need not to produce bass improves the sound quality in the mids. Intermodulation distortion, to mention a keyword, is avoided and the harmonic distortion of low frequencies, which basically occurs in the midst, is reduced. Distortion is another topic for an upcoming podcast. Even if you use a driver with an ideal frequency response, which for some full-range drivers and several tweeters is at least partly true, within a specific range they cannot be used without a crossover, because the baffle step is still a problem. Okay, the one mounting environment doesn't have that. An infinite baffle or in-wall mounting, which is a quasi-infinite baffle, because it is large in relation to the drivers, has no baffle step. To get well comparable results, most frequency plots of drivers are measured by manufacturers or the German, German DIY loudspeaker magazine Hobby Hi-Fi in an infinite baffle or in an IEC standard baffle. The latter has the dimensions of 1.65 meters by 1.35 meters, which is quite big in relation to most types of drivers. On such big baffles, drivers are more likely to behave ideally. Now you might think you wouldn't need a crossover for in-wall mounting, but of course all other problems still occur, as for example unwanted resonances at the cone breakup. Normally we work with relatively small enclosures which don't have huge baffles. On those we have three influencing factors which change the radiation pattern of a driver depending on the frequency. 1. Radiation is spherical if the emitted wavelength is several times larger than the baffle. 2. To higher frequencies the pattern transforms to a hemisphere where the wavelength is about as big as the baffle width wide. 3. The pattern transforms to planar radiation from that frequency on where the wavelength is at as big as the driver. I hope everyone remembers the law of conservation of energy from physics classes. At the spherical pattern, the acoustical energy is spread upon the surface of the, spe of the sphere. The surface area of a sphere is A is equal to 4 times P times radius squared. So the sound intensity decreases to the power of 2 with distance. To look at it from the other direction, the area on which the energy is spread increases with distance by the power of 2. On a hemisphere this looks quite similar, but the area is only half as big. The energy spreads on half of the area as on a sphere. So the energy at the same distance is twice as much as on the sphere, which means 6 decibels more. The exact ge geometry of the baffle also plays a role where the driver is located, how far off it is from top and bottom, etc. Therefore, the baffle step can be more than 6 decibels high, in rare cases up to 9 decibels. And this is located in a range where the hearing is most sensitive in the mids. I recommend my podcast about frequency response for details about hearing perception. Therefore, in a small box, which has the dimensions of the emitted wavelength, the commonly feared baffle step occurs. I mentioned planar radiation, which has not, such, and it's not so much relevance except for full range drivers. Normal midwoofers are not used in that range where, the, where they start focusing, which the 
uh, which is the effect that occurs at the transition from hemisphere to planar radiation. Usually that is the range where midwoofers emit less sound due to the radiation resistance of the diaphragm. The fifth reason for the use of crossovers is differences in volume, or to be more precise, sensitivity, between midwoofers and tweeters. The woofer determines the maximum overall sensitivity of the whole speaker together with the enclosure. Passive crossovers only allow attenuation, not amplification. Amplification is only possible in active crossovers, so the baffle step has to be compensated by the crossover by attenuating down to the SPL of the base. Usually tweeters have a higher sensitivity than midwoofers. Most dome tweet tweeters produce about 90 decibels per watt per meter, which means 90 decibels from 2.83 volts at a distance of 1 meter. An average 5-inch woofer only produces about 80 decibels per watt per meter in the base. A cross crossover can look as complicated as this if you want to get the frequency response perfect. If you use expensive drivers, it may even be worth every penny you put into this much parts. I'm already preparing a podcast about the different types of parts and their qualities and a video about what quality to use at which position of the crossover. What you see on the screen at the moment is a short glimpse of that. I want to mention that all of this about baffle step correction is used for multi-way speakers. In one-way or full-range speakers, baffle step is often corrected by mounting the driver in a horn enclosure which lifts the base to about the same level as the mids. Especially for 8-inch drivers, it is very common to use a horn which boosts up the volume up to the lower mid-range instead of heavily attenuating the mids to achieve a balanced response. Basically, this all shows that a correction of the frequency response by a crossover network is essential. Even those just mentioned horn-loaded full-range drivers still have a little emphasis in the mids because the boost of the horn is not enough to balance the response. As I said, sometimes a difference of 9 decibels has to be flattened out and therefore a correction network even makes sense for full-rangers in a horn. My next topic is how to get it wrong, but from there I give a positive outlook at the end. Often we see, mostly in cheap speakers, only a high-pass capacitor in series with a tweeter, for example in a coaxial system for cars. This is of course done to prevent it getting damaged by low frequencies. Midwoofers in car hi-fi often use highly dampened cone materials to keep the cone breakup more or less clear from resonances to get a smooth roll-off. I doubt that that is sufficient in all cases and recommend measuring each individual subject. Presumably it's not the optimal solution to only use one capacitor because, as I will explain in a minute, both slopes have to, be, have to match each other and should be symmetrical. Otherwise the sum at the crossover point is not ideal due to phase problems. If the slopes are not symmetrical, cancellations or suboptimal summation occur where both drivers emit sound. That leads to nonlinear responses. A mistake many people make who did not yet dive deep into speaker building but like the idea of creating one of their own is using crossover calculators from the internet, which many speaker part online shops offer, or formulas from a book. Of course, a calculation with a formula is possible, which works very well in active crossovers, but due to all the reasons I mentioned before, resonances, absence of idea responses, baffle step and so on, these formulas don't work for passive speakers. Another very important reason why formulas don't work is that impedance responses of drivers are not linear. I already explained that in my podcast about impedance responses. 
Basically, these formulas aren't wrong, but you need to know the impedance plot to get a reasonable result, because the exact impedance at the crossover frequency counts. You need to know the frequency response of the driver mounted on the enclosure, and then you can, uh, can use these formulas to get a starting point for your model, for example in box sim. I usually go that way. I look at the frequency response of my mounted drivers to see how the baffle step looks like. You can see how I work that out in my tutorial how to design a passive crossover network for a two-way speaker. I try to describe all steps vividly in it. Here's a short summary of the video. I normally use these formulas which are also incorporated into a crossover calculator in BoxSim to attenuate the buffer step. I take the point where the buffer step is 3 decibels higher than the base, that is the crossover point, which has to be put into the formula because the crossover frequency is defined at that point where the amplitude is decreased by 3 decibels. This is as well a bit problematic because this is not the real crossover point in the end, because if two drivers are in phase and have the same SPL there, their sum is 6 decibels higher than each one of them and not 3 decibels as the formula seems to predict. As I said, I take it as a starting point for my simulation and adjust the values from there to a good looking graph. I earlier mentioned that I start them at the midwoofer because the base determines the SPL of the whole box. I flatten out the baffle step, then look where resonances have to be suppressed, where some work has to be done. The best thing would be a minimal phase shift with a first order crossover with a slope of 6 decibels per octave. If I can create a very nice looking curve that way, and if only a few and small resonances are present in the lower travel, then a first order crossover might produce an adequate result. It further depends on what I get when I flatten out the buffer step. Where the falling slope starts, where the minus 6 decibel point is, and if the tweeter is capable of taking over at that point. More about that in the next podcast. If I don't get a good result, it perhaps helps to try a higher crossover frequency and at first keep a little of the buffer step and later flatten it out with a parallel RLC circuit in series, or better, a series RLC circuit in parallel to the driver. The one in parallel is better because it doesn't add any lossy parts in series with the driver. The less parts in series, the less the probability to lose sound quality. These circuits, unfortunately, cannot fully be calculated by hand. We get the center frequency with the following formula. F is equal to 5000 divided by square root of L times C, with L in millihenry and C in microfarad. Then I try out the correct values in BoxSim. Here again I use the formula for high or low pass as a starting point for either L or C. For a parallel RLC circuit, I calculate L at the lowest frequency of the bump. For a serious RLC, I calculate L at the highest frequency of the bump. At first I leave out the resistor to find the correct center frequency. Then I try different values for R until the bump has the correct level at the center frequency. Unfortunately, the resistor changes the bandwidth of the RLC circuit, so L and C have to be adjusted. Parallel RLC, bigger coil, and smaller caps means bigger bandwidth. Series RLC react the opposite. Bigger cap and smaller coil means bigger bandwidth. It works best to change both with the same amount, for example plus minus 20% or plus minus 50% or increase and decrease tenfold until it fits. Here the E series of preferred values comes handy because for most electronic parts, E12 values are available. These values are 10, 12, 15, 18, 22, 27, 33, 39, 47, 56, 68, 82 and 100. Then it continues 120, 150, 180 etc. 
we can just go the same amount of steps in both directions and the center frequency remains roughly the same. Quick example, L is 1 millihenry, C 5.6 microfarad, then F is 2113 Hz. We vary three E12 values, L is now 1.8 millihenry, C is now 3.3 microfarad, then F is 2051 hertz, so only 3% deviation. If the first order filter doesn't suppress all high, higher resonances, I add a capacitor in parallel to the driver to upgrade to a second order filter. If that still isn't enough, I change to a third order filter or add series RLC circuits in parallel to the driver. Only if cone breakup resonances are suppressed by more than 20 decibels in comparison to the final average SPL, they aren't audible any longer. Aren't they suppressed far enough? You can find out by listening by a listening test if they are audible and or bother. But that's a later step in crossover development and not obvious that early. The steepness of the slope is determined by the midwoofer and the tweeter then needs the same steepness. Due to the natural slope of most tweeters, I only shape it a little bit more with the high pass until it matches. The natural slope has to be taken into account, which is another reason why a single capacitor, a simple filter calculator or a formula don't fully work. Therefore I shape both slopes symmetrical to get a smooth transition and a summation of 6 decibels in an ideal case. That means both drivers are in phase at that point. As I said, have a look at my tutorial how to design a two-way crossover. A word about serious RLC circuits in parallel to the driver. Many manufacturers of commercial speakers in particular don't take the effort to design this into their crossovers. They sacrifice the best possible response for lower costs. Unfortunately, many audio test magazines seem to have abandoned print and fr printing frequency responses during the last years. Most times I saw diagrams shown in magazines, I noticed nonlinear areas, small humps or such, mostly below the crossover frequency. Where the crossover frequency lies, I usually guess from the impedance plot, as I explained in my podcast about impedance responses. I don't want to say that those small humps are very bad, often they aren't. Most of the time it's quite okay, but I think there sometimes is room for improvement. If you want to know more about how you can modify your speakers to make them better than off-the-shelf ones, please have a look at my video Top 10 DIY Speaker Improvements. As you can see now, it is not an easy task to design a really good crossover. You need some experience for that. You can train that by using hardware. For that you need an adequate inventory of crossover parts. You can as well you train by using software as BoxSim. I did that too. Until now I modeled hundreds of crossovers by playing around with values and topologies. Further, I played around with BoxSim's built-in crossover optimizer and tried out how it works, what it does and what the outcome what outcome it produces. If you don't have enough time or enthusiasm to get this experience, you can on the other hand build a well-designed kit developed by someone else, for example the magazines Hobby Hi-Fi or Klang und Ton, manufacturers websites like Visaton.com or some distributors who offer their own kits. Make sure that they have measured graphs available and allow a prediction of the quality of the kit or even better, if you know a reliable independent source for measurements that verify some of the, the other measurements. That's all for today. Next planned topics are distortion plot, waterfall spectrum, Tele small parameters, all types of crossover paths and various enclosure types. If you have other suggestions, please write a comment below. If you found a mistake, please have a look at the comments to see if I already corrected it. If I didn't, then leave a message. Thank you for listening and I'm happy if you listen to my other podcasts or watch some of my videos. If you like what I do, 
please subscribe. Until next time, bye!